What does a day in the life working in IT actually look like? My name is Jake. I work remote IT at an MSP. An MSP is a managed service provider, so we give IT services to other companies. And these are all of the tickets that I touched yesterday. I touched 16 tickets in total, and overall, I'd say this was a pretty average day. Most of my morning was consumed by SFTP. SFTP is Secure File Transfer Protocol. I had two automated tasks on an SFTP server that were just not working well. One was grabbing some files and moving them to multiple other places, and the internal IT contact had set up a naming scheme, and the naming scheme was based off of date, month, hour, minute, second. But the problem was it was grabbing these files so fast that multiple files were getting moved in the same second. And so they were getting the same exact destination name and the program was not liking this. So I had to look through program documentation, really troubleshoot how can I make this name unique? We ultimately landed on using a random number generator. They have a random function where you can just append a string of like six random numbers at the end. That solved the problem for this one. And then there was another SFTP task that a vendor is uploading SFTP files. I should say uploading files into the SFTP server and they were getting an error. I think it might have to do with the size of the file or a connection timeout on their side, but that one's one of those situations where I'm trying to use the data as good as I can troubleshoot away and then segue with the internal IT to talk with the vendor where I, realistically, I'd rather just be talking to the vendor myself asking them, Hey, what are you seeing? What data do you have? Where can we go from here? So that was maybe an hour in the morning. After this, I had a request to block some phone numbers in Cisco Unified Call Manager. I do not know how to do this. So I reached out to my internal contacts. I'm seeing if anyone knew how to do it. They didn't know how to do it either. I was doing some research looking into like routing patterns and stuff like that. But to be honest with you, this is already outside of my wheelhouse. I reached out to my network engineer buddy who has his CCNP voice and he said, yeah, I know how to do it. Assign me the ticket. So basically I just looked at it, researched it, realized it was out of my wheelhouse and assigned him. After this, I had an interesting ticket where I have an organization that has like four 450 Windows devices. They are cloud only and we want to set up laps using Intune. So I had a laps policy that I had set up using an admin template, but it turns out that I use like the old format of admin templates in Intune. So I had to go in and research and figure out how to actually get laps to work for this organization. And realize that you do it through endpoint security with Intune. So I set up a new laps solution. And then on top of that, we had an internal contact who has to be the lapse password administrator. So I wanted to give him access to see those lapse passwords. For those of you who don't know, lapse is local administrator password solution. Uh, basically, it just makes a local admin on devices and then rotates that local admin. Um, so if, some, if you're off the domain or if no other password is working, you at least have an admin password that you can use to get in. So another difficult part of that ticket was setting this guy up so that he can see these lapse passwords, but not anything else. I didn't want him to be a full cloud identity administrator where he can delete devices and stuff like that. We're using this concept of least privilege, setting him up with those perms. I had to make a custom intra role for a lapse password administrator, found some Microsoft documentation. It's super easy. Basically, I just set up a role where he can go into the intra portal and he can see the lapse password and that's it. After this, we had a test cohort of a couple of devices and the lapse passwords weren't syncing very well. I had no idea why they weren't syncing very well, so I troubleshot that for a while, ran some commands backstage in the devices, made them check in with Intune, and then ultimately just waited until this morning. And this morning I go in the portal and I can see the lapse passwords for my devices. So just waiting on confirmation for my internal contact for that. After this, I had another uh, admin account related ticket and admin, a privileged account was getting failed logins from one device to another. And we have an internal operations report that kind of like reports uh, when this happens, I guess. To be honest with you, I don't know the utility of the report because the account wasn't getting locked out or anything. It was just like a failed login here and there, which happens. But so I did some investigation into that and I ultimately ended up working with a coworker of mine at security services to exclude this logout failure for this account because it was so infrequent and it was just kind of extra noise in the report. Ticket number five, I had a user uh, using SSO for an enterprise app. Basically, he's using single sign-on to log into this app, uses Microsoft creds, and he just wasn't showing up in their portal. So I just had to remove him from the enterprise app in Entra, re-add him. And again, I'm waiting on an internal contact to get back with me. You see, this is a trend in IT as well. You do work, maybe you do good work, maybe you do bad work, and then you wait. And then if nobody says anything, it probably went well. And if somebody comes back yelling, probably didn't go well and you have more work to do. After this, my sixth ticket, I had a tier one reach out to me. I'm a tier two. He needed assistance because Windows was being really goofy. Basically the start menu wasn't showing up and you couldn't go to settings or anything like that. Really goofy. So he didn't know how to update the device. Helped him with doing that through PowerShell. With PowerShell, 
PowerShell. We use it all the time in the job, but we're at a point where you can Google or chat GPT basically any command you ever need. I use PowerShell all the time. I remember very few commands because I just don't need them. But so we figured this out. We got Windows updates to go through. Still didn't work. He had already done SFC scan now. He had already done DISM. He had already done his Dell command and Dell support assist stuff. So everything looked good. I recommended him to do a Windows 11 in place upgrade just to make sure that the image was good on the device. Still didn't work. Ultimately, he was the one doing the work. You know, this is taking, I mean, half an hour for him to do all of this stuff. So I'm just kind of guiding him along. He ultimately ended up finding out that one of those Dell utilities was what was causing all of the issues in the first place. And so he actually did a great job and kind of solved an org wide issue where a lot more of this was starting to happen where these devices are popping up and they got all these weird symptoms and it just didn't make sense and nothing was working. And it was Dell's own utility that was breaking this. He did a great job. I was happy to be there to help him out a little bit. After this, I had a fellow system administrator with a admin account that was getting persistent account lockouts. Account lockouts are absolutely terrible because they're difficult to find the source sometimes, but I've dealt with them a couple of times. And so I helped her uh, using data and using a script and using a utility that we have called NetRix to figure out where the source of this lockout is coming from. And then kind of we can hone in on interactive, non-interactive sign-ins, looking at things like credential manager, task scheduler, if it's using these credentials for something with the task, um, if there's any running service that's logging on as these credentials and just has an old password stored that can cause these uh, continuous account lockouts. Sometimes they're very, very difficult, but basically I just gave her the process like, hey, run this script, find these event codes. This is where it's being locked out from. Now, at least we can hone in on that and try and do some digging and figure out why. After this, I had a lovely meeting with a senior network engineer and uh, my manager trying to reconcile some of the internal processes we have for reporting where certain tickets for link down and edge down tickets. So when an ISP link goes down or an entire edge of a network goes down, we have these tickets that report. One of them is redundant. So if an edge goes down, it means that we're going to have other tickets automatically pop like P1 tickets because the entire that means the entire branch is down. So I feel like those tickets are redundant because there's always going to be a P1 that pops and then we just have to bundle the tickets. So trying to get those to go away and then discuss reporting times with the other tickets and how the actual process works when we get them. Oftentimes, if an ISP link goes down, we'll call the ISP and say, hey, is there a known outage? If there's not, it's basically always a reboot the modem and reseat all of the cables situation and then see if it works again. Usually it does. And then maybe the last 10% of instant there's actually some kind of network configuration error that's going on and we need to reconcile it, but it's very few and far between. So trying to kind of get those tickets to go away, uh, but it's an uphill process when you have bureaucracy. People prefer for it to report and for there actually not to be an issue than for it to not report and there to be an issue, if that makes sense. After this, I had an internal contact reach out because he has an audit coming up. And so I got to set up a GPO changing some we'll call it settings with a service starting automatically. I'm trying to be a little bit obscure here. Really, it was a super easy GPO. There was already an admin template. You just go into computer configuration and start this service. I have a test cohort of devices, like five of them, kind of like my lapse policy. We'll always test out with maybe five devices. If everything works well, then we'll roll it out domain wide. You don't want to just test domain wide because what if you break something really bad? you break every device on the domain. I set this up. Honestly, it's really cookie cutter GPO. It took me like 10 minutes probably. And I'm just waiting on him to get back to me that I can actually roll this out. After this, we had an issue where a vendor's website was not working while people were on VPN. This is actually pretty common where we have a login and we have to have the vendor whitelist our public IP for a branch location so that that branch can actually get in. Basically the vendor's server lets them in. In this situation, we have a public IP for the branch. We have a different public IP for actually our VPN because uh, it's in our data center. So we had to have the vendor whitelist this other IP. Had another very common situation where I reach out to the vendor. I tell them all the information, everything they need. Then at the end of the ticket, they're like, okay, who can I put as an email? And I give them my email. They realize that it's not part of the bank and they're like, oh, I actually can't do anything for you. So I have to go to the bank internal contact and say, hey, you need to make a ticket with this vendor. I already gave them all the information they need. They just won't talk to me. <laughs> and so the internal contact's gonna reach out to them and we'll see if we can get that IP whitelist. It should be pretty, pretty textbook. Something you see all the time. After this, we're on to my 11th ticket where a user had deleted a file on the file server and then freaked out super bad. It wasn't in Recycle Bin and everyone was scared and they were like, hey, it went away. Um, we have a data protection team. So I just pointed this tier one in, in the right direction uh, to the guy who can recover this file. It's it's really easy. You just got to know where to go. And it's scary at first, but fortunately we take backups all the time. I would take snapshots all the time. So file recovery is pretty easy for us. After this, I had a tier one reach out for a core software for a company. There was just an issue that they had going on. And basically I just had to track down some documentation for this issue. It was 
a situation where was I needed? Probably not. The tier one could have done a little bit more work tracking down documentation himself, but he reached out to me. I was the system administrator, so I found the documentation and got it to him and he was able to resolve the issue. Honestly, it was a password reset in this core software. I, I can't believe he didn't find it, but stuff happens. You know, sometimes you slip up and you don't check the sources you're supposed to check. I've done it many times myself too. After this, I again had a tier one reach out to me because someone was having an H drive issue. The source of this H drive issue was a security group, but the thing about this company is a little bit weird. Most of our companies are hybrid companies where they have on-premises Active Directory that syncs to the cloud. This is also a hybrid company, but this company no longer has a file server. All of their documents are in the cloud. So her H drive, her home profile was also in the cloud and it was just being goofy. She was a new user. So we found a group that she wasn't in. We put her in the group. We confirmed that someone else who did have H drive access was in this group. And then we synced her up and I actually haven't gotten back with him on whether it worked or not. So we'll see. After this, I spent about an hour and a half in the afternoon working on more of that SFTP stuff. Honestly, it was the same issues from earlier, you know, maybe an hour in the morning, maybe an hour in the afternoon, just trying to figure out what was going on with that. My 15th ticket was an easy ticket and it was to find some static IPs for two new printers that this company was gonna put on the network. Anytime we have a printer, we always want the IP to be static and we always want the IP to be outside of the DHCP pool the DHCP range. This is where networking is important because if you have a subnet, you need to know how many available IPs there are. If you can look at Windows Server DHCP, you can see, hey, it goes from this IP to this IP. Maybe it's a range of 100 IPs. And then you can say, which IPs do I have available at the tail end of this after the end of that DHCP range? Realistically, once we know that, it's find an IP, ping it. If it doesn't ping, it's probably not in use. You can use it for that printer and then document the heck out of it. Because if you give things static IPs and then you forget what they are and you don't document them, uh, it becomes a nightmare later when the company grows and makes a ton of money and gets a lot more employees and a lot more computers that all need IPs and you have to extend that range. And then you got things getting duplicate IPs because DHCP is handing out IPs that are already static on other devices and it's a big nightmare. So if you're going to give a static IP, which we do document it really, really well. I gave him his static IPs, was able to run IP config on a functional device at that branch, figure out what the default gateway should be, of course, figure out what the subnet mask should be, and then figure out which DNS server he should set for those printers. He set them up, everything worked great. And then lastly, to end the day, I had a priority one ticket. It was an executive whose VPN wasn't working. This is super common. VPN's not working. Uh, we have a few VPNs that we troubleshoot. OpenVPN, Cisco, AnyConnect, FortiGate, WatchGuard from time to time. We'll do those VPNs. But most of our stuff is Cisco, AnyConnect, and OpenVPN. In this case, it was OpenVPN. It was being a little bit goofy. Basically, there are two ways that you can set up authentication with a VPN. You can use Radius, which uses Active Directory on-premises. It'll send basically an NPS network policy server request to Radius so it uses their Active Directory username and password. Or you can use SAML. SAML is more modern and it's what most of our companies are on. That uses Microsoft directly and you can enforce things like conditional access and MFA easier with SAML. We still have MFA either way. It's not that much different in that regard for us. But I found that this company was using the old form of authentication using Radius. And if you're going to use Radius, you have to have this thing checked on these people's Active Directory profile. You have to go to the dial in tab and you have to have control access through NPS checked. It took me maybe 30, 35 minutes to figure this out. She didn't have a check, finally got her into VPN. I had to do like some RDP stuff, like show her how to use RDP and things like that. But we ultimately we got her in, was able to get that reconciled in like 40 minutes, which was really nice. Finished the day off. This total day was, I'm looking at my time now, 7 a.m. to 4.15 p.m. with probably a 20 minute lunch. I worked quite a bit this day, honestly, just because of the SFTP stuff, it was taking up all my time, just trying to figure out what was going on with that stuff. This is a day in the life actually working in IT as a tier two system administrator at an MSP. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions or want more content like this, let me know in the comments. Appreciate you guys. Have a good day. Be safe, be smart, and make some good decisions.